Good. Okay, yeah, let me introduce our speaker. Today we're happy to uh, have uh, Slava Richkov from uh, ENS and EHES uh, in Paris, and he's going to uh, tell us about uh, uh, replicas energy. Please, Slava, go on. Thanks, uh, Vitya. Well, it's uh, nice to be across the ocean. And uh, well, last time I, actually, I think I gave only one talk in Stanford and it was a while ago. I think it was just after we bootstrapped uh, for the first time the 3D easing and I talked about that. So, so it looks like I'm always destined to talk about the easing model at Stanford. So today I'm going to talk about random field easing model. So it's based on a, on a couple of papers that I recently wrote with upper team Kaviraj and Emilio Trevisani. I'm not going to quite follow the, the plan of the papers. So it's going to be a bit of a motivation if you wish and, and the introduction and maybe it's going to um, make you interested and read those papers. And uh, I'm going to make it rather informal and um, and I'm not going to like assign credits and tell you the full story and give you all the suspense and everything. So it's going to be kind of business-like. Um, so it's, uh, the, the talk is going to be about the uh, thermodynamic uh, that is uh, a finite temperature uh, phase transition in um, in a classical thermagnetic easing model in uh, D dimensions. And my model is going to be to have quenched disorder. So that's the, full, the whole point. Uh, but first uh, let's reco recall what is uh, happening with the model without disorder. So without disorder, uh, we know that, uh, well, without disorder, the easing model is defined on, uh, on some cubic lattice, say, in ZD. And uh, we have uh, spins plus or minus one, and we have nearest neighbor interactions. So the Hamiltonian is minus uh, SISJ with some coupling over nearest neighbors. <clears throat> and uh, with disorder, there are two ways to introduce disorder into this picture. And I'm actually going to speak about both of them uh, in order to contrast the two. So there are, there's bond disorder. And this is done by, uh, by taking the Hamiltonian and by um, replacing it uh, with the following Hamiltonian. So I take this J and I replace J by J plus delta J I J. Uh, and this delta J I J is a random perturbation of the coupling. So I'm assuming that uh, its average value uh, delta J I J is zero. So on every, uh, on every bond, I introduced this uh, random perturbation, independent random perturbation uh, of this coupling delta J. So that's, the, that's called bond disorder. And then there is field disorder. So in the field disorder, I also perturb the Hamiltonian. And uh, so the perturbation that I'm adding is not in J, so J still stays a constant. But then I adding these new variables, random variables HI, SI on every side of the easing model. And so they couple to easing spins and uh, they have again, average value zero. So the average value, I'm adding magnetic field on every lattice side with average value zero. And again, it's independent on each side. And you know, there is some second moment, HI squared is some constant 
H, uh, which is site independent. So that's uh, this is the picture. So, uh, so there are these two ways to introduce uh, disorder, and uh, they share the two things uh, that they share in common is that this is quenched disorder. And quenched, uh, just to remind you, it means that uh, when I compute a two point function, say of two spins, so it's denoted like, th it's denoted like this, it means that I first take. I compute, uh, for example, in, in the field disorder case, I compute first the two-point function by averaging over uh, spins with some particular realization of disorder. So dividing by, uh, by the partition function. And then I average everything. So I put some uh, overall average, which is the average over H. So, uh, so this, uh, in other words, these disordered perturbations, they represent some frozen in impurities in, in the easing model. And these impurities, they can be uh, non-magnetic or magnetic impurities. So the non-magnetic impurities, they represent the bond disorder and the magnetic impurities, the impurities which have their own magnetic moment, they represent the field disorder. So this is, uh, this is the model. Any question at this point? OK. Uh, so it's known that this uh, introduction of disorder in the model, it can change the universality class of the phase transition. So now I'm going to change the temperature of, of, the, of each of these models, and I can, uh, I would like to find the temperature for which the model has a phase transition, and I would like to discuss the universality class of this phase transition. And so, uh, uh, Slava, question. Yeah. So, the, in principle, two parameters now you can change the temperature and you could change the relative strength of J versus capital H. Yeah. Yeah, let, let me fix J, let me fix capital H, and let me just vary the temperature. Okay, and there is no interesting behavior in that ratio? Big uh, J over big H. Well, in this case, there's not too much interesting behavior. Like if I change, if I pick H too large, mm -hmm. then, uh, then uh, the model is not going to have any interesting phase transition. But if H is not too large, with respect okay. to J, then uh, universality class is not going to depend on how large it is. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, okay, so this is the, I would like to understand uh, these three cases and I would like to understand what's different about them. And I'm not, uh, so I introduced this microscopic models, but I, from this moment on, I'm going to use the language of field theory, because I'm interested uh, near the phase transition, I'm going to use the language of field theory. So in the case of uh, without, in the case without disorder, then uh, the field theory of interest is uh, phi to the fourth model. So, uh, so the Lagrangian is uh, d phi squared plus v of phi. And uh, V is some mass term plus lambda phi to the fourth. And I'm supposed to tune this mass term to put the model at the critical point. Tune to the transition. Now, uh, when I add disorder in field theory language, it means that I'm going to take this field theory and I'm going to add to it a perturbation. And both, uh, so in both cases that I'm interested in, the perturbation is going to have the form uh, integral dx, j of x, o of x, uh, where j of x is going to be a random variable, uh, which is going to be short, short range correlated. So j of x, j x prime, uh, or average is going to be equal to 
uh, delta x minus x prime with some overall strength h. And uh, the two cases of disorder, they, they will correspond to two different choices of O. So O of x equals phi squared is going to be bond disorder and phi is going to be field disorder. So, um, so this is the, this is what I would like to study. And uh, the standard way to study uh, disordered phase transition in field theory, but also in uh, also in lattice microscopic lattice models is, uh, is the method of replicas. And I'm also going to use the method of replicas today. And I'm, um, I'm not going to discuss uh, much subtleties related to the use of the method of replicas. I can discuss it in the end if people are interested in, uh, but uh, in, in this case, it is believed that subtleties of these problems, they lie not so much in, in, the, in the replica symmetry breaking or stuff like that, but in different things. But if people are interested, I can comment in the end. So in the method of replicas, hello? Yeah, so sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in the Ising model, uh, is, the, uh, is the magnetic field along the Z direction or the X direction? Well, I'm using the, I'm using the statistical physics classical Ising model so it's not a it's not a quantum first decision; it's a thermodynamic oh, decision. Okay. So, so so s variable is just plus or minus one. There's only one direction, and along okay, this okay, direction, okay. I'm adding a magnetic field. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. So it's statistical physics. There's no quantum mechanics here. Okay. So uh, so in the method of replicas that I I presume people at least uh, are a little bit familiar with. And I'm not going to justify it. Uh, uh, I'm not going to repeat the justification. So the what uh, the method of replica consists in going through a few steps. So the first step is I'm taking the action of my Slava, model. Sorry, could I ask a very naive question? You wrote sure. there the two point function of the J is the it's totally local. Is this yeah. obvious that uh, the effect of the disorder in the Infrared should be something which is again completely local, like it is in the UV. Like the correlations of that should be totally local. Um, well, uh, well, there are two ways to study this problem. There are there are there is one way is to uh, not to use the method of replicas, but to introduce the disorder with this disorder distribution into the problem and try to use RG for this disorder distribution. That's one way. The other way which I'm going to use today is to, to do the method of replicas to integrate out the disorder. At this point, all uh, the subtleties, all the distribution of disorder and everything, it is encoded, it becomes encoded in uh, various interactions which are present between uh, the replicas of, of your replicated theory. And that's what I'm going to study. I'm going to study the evolution of this effective Lagrangian of the replicated theory. And that effective Lagrangian is going to be studied using the usual techniques of, of the local quantum field theory. So there's going to be some, there are going to be some fixed points, there are going to be some perturbations of fixed points and everything is going to be local as usual in field theory. So that's the method I'm going to use. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but uh, I'm uh, on the one, I'm, I'm kind of circumventing this question if you wish. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not uh, asking the question of what is the effective infrared disorder distribution. But so because it turns out to be hard. It turns out to be hard. So there are some problems that it's my understanding is that there are some disordered problems 
where you can really like follow this disorder distribution, try to understand what it happens with, uh, with it in the infrared. But this is not one of these problems. It's extremely hard to follow, to do RG in terms of this complicated disorder distribution. So people don't do that. I haven't seen people do this uh, problem in this language. Well, in other problems, sometimes people succeed doing that. <clears throat> so, um, all right. So in this method of replicas, I'm going to take my uh, action, I'm going to replace it by uh, a replicated action. So it's going to be n copies. And uh, in particular, so this n copies are going to have the form uh, sum d phi i squared plus v of phi i summed from one to n. And, and there's and all these n copies of uh, replicas, they are coupled to the same realization of disorder. This is the first step. And uh, okay, in the end, I'm going to take the limit and going to zero. That's the whole point of, of this method. Uh, in the second step, I'm, I'm going to integrate out the disorder and now I'm going to make an additional assumption which is not the assumption I made so far, is that the disorder distribution is not only local, but it's also Gaussian. So I'm going to take the disorder distribution is really uh, something like that. So that's, uh, uh, th th this is a, it looks like an important assumption at this stage, but later on when I do their G analysis, I'm going to Mm, to, 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 to phrase it in a way that will be symmetry based. And so that if I, even if I started at this point with some more complicated disorder distribution and integrated it out, it would still be captured by, by my RG analysis. But if I take this uh, uh, disorder distribution, which is Gaussian, then I can integrate it out completely from my uh, from my replicated action. And it's, it's going to replace this perturbation here by, once I integrated out J, it's going to replace it by minus H uh, sum OI squared. So at this point, I no longer have disorder in the game. I just have a complicated Lagrangian with n copies of fields and they're coupled in a particular way. And I have to understand, I have to figure out what this Lagrangian does, where it flows, does it have a fixed point? Does this fixed point make sense for every n or just for n equals zero and things like that. And the first thing I have to understand is whether uh, this part, this new interaction that I have in my theory, whether it's a relevant interaction or whether it's an irrelevant interaction. If it's an irrelevant interaction, then the disorder just does nothing. Then the universality class does not change with the introduction of disorder. And uh, but this is very easy to understand. What what happens is that uh, we have the relevant operator. Uh, the operator that we have to look at uh, is OI or J with I not equal to J. And uh, this operator has dimension since the, so I'm considering this as a perturbation around decoupled replicas. So the dimension of this operator is just twice the dimension of O. So I, 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 I get the conclusion that the disorder is relevant <coughs> if if delta O is less than D over two. So this is disorder is relevant. And this is called Harris criterion. And in particular, uh, if you look at the, if you look at the Ising model, then this criterion is satisfied for both bond disorder and field disorder. It's satisfied in four minus epsilon dimensions, it's satisfied in three dimensions, so it's uh, so in all of these cases the disorder is relevant. So the universality class of phase transition is going to change. The critical exponents are going to change, and so we face the question of how to compute these critical exponents. 
this is what I'm going to discuss next. Any questions? All right. So uh, the the computation of critical exponents is uh, the situation is uh, a bit different for bond and field disorder. Actually, for bond disorder case, it's much easier. So in, in the border disorder case, we have to deal with this perturbation. Uh, so bond disorder, just to show you the simple case, the perturbation is, as I said, minus H uh, sum, well, let me write it without sum, just uh, uh, phi one squared plus dot, 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 plus phi n squared, squared, that's my perturbation. And uh, from, the symmetry point of view, if you have n copies of, uh, of the theory, uh, this perturbation preserves, uh, from the symmetry point of view, it preserves symmetry Sn semi-direct uh, Z2 to the n, because I can basically do independent uh, sign flips, phi i goes to minus phi i, they all preserve, so it's called cubic symmetry. Uh, but the simplicity of this case is uh, based on the fact that this perturbation is, it's a quartic perturbation. And so it's weakly relevant in D equal four minus epsilon. So, uh, so basically, just like in the usual easing model, we can set up the epsilon expansion and we can do perturbations in epsilon if you want to do, and we can kind of connect universality classes, uh, they're in D, they're in N and things like that. All of this extends also to this case. So in particular, uh, in particular upper critical dimension of this problem is four. Uh, so another thing which is interesting is that for every n, so we have a CFT which exists for every n, we can compute the critical exponents for every n, and then we can, you know, since we are interested in n equals zero case, we, we can compute them for every n, we can take the limit for n when n goes to zero, or we can compute them directly at n equals zero. I mean, it depends on what you're interested in, but you can slice it and dice it wherever you want. There's a family of CFTs, depending on that. So uh, remember these features because in the field disorder case that I'm going to discuss next, they're not going to be true. Any more questions about bone disorder? Um, I have a very naive question. Uh, what's the sign of this interaction? Is it, does it correspond to the inverted uh, quartic potential? Yeah, this H, uh, this coupling uh, is uh, is negative with respect to the uh, with respect to the uh, coupling of each copy, which is positive. Uh, this coupling, which arises after integrate out disorder, is always negative. But that's not necessarily a problem because the total potential is a sum of the two terms and it can still be positive definite. And it is. What are the CFTNs? Are the minimum models or the CFTNs? Uh, well, no, they are not. Min uh, they are not. Uh, you mean if you go to 2D? Yeah, yeah, 2D. Well, well, actually, in 2D, it doesn't work because in 2D, this interaction uh, is no longer relevant. Is In 2D, this interaction becomes marginal. And so there's uh, the, the, this uh, bond disorder situation is different in 2D. Because in 2D, if this would be the interaction epsilon i, epsilon j. And since epsilon is 1 in 2D, this is a marginal interaction. So this works for every dimension between two and uh, four and two, but not in two. Okay, thank you. 
So this is kind of textbook material. Uh, if you look at Cardi's book, he discusses this there. And, and there was also an interesting paper by uh, Komargotsky and Simons Duffin about bond disorder, this all. So there are many ways to approach this problem. So let me now go to the field disorder case, which is def decidedly, uh, decidedly more confusing uh, for many people. So in the, in the field disorder case, the problem, so, okay, a priori it's, you know, you just do the same thing. So you get the action, which is some phi i squared plus V of phi i. And then there is this uh, kind of joint negative mass term for a sum of phi i minus h sum of phi i squared. So this is the action you have to work. So, uh, so you see that uh, the symmetry of this Lagrangian is different from the bond disorder case. So that's what makes it a different uh, situation. So in this case, the symmetry is uh, Z2 direct product SN. So we, we do not have the possibility of independent sign flips. But the most uh, important difference is that this perturbation is, is a strongly relevant perturbation. It's not the weakly relevant perturbation. And actually, if you look at the literature, uh, you will see that the upper critical dimension of this theory is six. So you get, you get a, a non-trivial critical behavior uh, in a larger range of dimensions, all the way up to six. And then there is actually another feature uh, is that there is no CFT, no CFT for uh, any N, but what happens is that if you have a non-zero N, then this theory is gapped. Uh, but as you take the limit and going to zero, this gap becomes larger and larger. And then in the limit when n is zero, then you get some scaling variant, uh, conformal invariant here. So that's so th these two features are very different from uh, from the bond disorder case. And uh, well, how can you see this? So uh, if, if you look at uh, when I first started uh, uh, getting interested in this uh, model, in this problem a few years ago, uh, I, I was very confused about the arguments that people usually give um, for this uh, problem in, um, in condensed matter literature. So in fact, uh, if you look at the usual arguments, then uh, they look uh, kind of, they don't follow the usual RG paradigm, which we all kind of believe and understand, but they look like something cooked up specifically for this problem. And the usual argument goes something like that. Well, uh, you have a theory with two coupling constants. So you, you, you have here lambda phi to the fourth in the potential. And the dimension of the coupling lambda in d dimensions is four minus d, the mass dimension. And then you have this parameter h, which, which is a mass parameter, so its dimension is two. And then people kind of try to argue that in fact, what you have to look at, you have to look at the effective coupling, which is the product of lambda times h. So its dimension is uh, six minus d. And and so, and, and so that what people try to argue is that in this theory, you have kind of an irrelevant coupling if you're close to six dimensions. You have an irrelevant coupling lambda, which runs to zero. It's an irrelevant coupling. But simultaneously, you have a strongly relevant coupling H, which blows up, it runs to infinity in the infrared. But somehow the product of these two couplings is what determines the physics. And this product of these two couplings is near marginal and so magically you get some scaling variant situation. So th this is kind of uh, the usual argument. 
And to, and to convince yourself that indeed the coupling is lambda effective, you know, sometimes you, you try to do some perturbative arguments, you compute some diagrams, and you see that you compute some corrections, you see that those corrections somehow always involve this product of the top couplings lambda times h. So uh, kind of you say, oh, well, these are the important diagrams and they involve product lambda times h, h, and those diagrams are not important. So, you know, when I first like encountered these arguments, I thought, well, I, mean, I was not satisfied by this at all. I thought, well, this is, this looks so non-Wilsonian because, uh, you know, why isn't this problem the same as what Wilson taught us that near the upper critical dimension, I just want to see a theory which would have some marginal coupling and I wouldn't have to like hook up this marginal coupling by a product of two couplings. I just want to see fields which have marginal interactions. That's what I want to see. Why is this weird than this problem? I, 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 was, I was very confused. But fortunately, I, I found uh, pretty soon, I found a paper uh, by John Cardi, a very nice paper by John Cardi. And that's one of the few papers that I'm going to, uh, to cite in this talk. So it's a paper from 85, a while ago. But somehow this paper is not at all appreciated by this, uh, by, by this community. I don't know, this paper has very few citations, like a typical John Cardi's paper has hundreds of thousands of citations. This paper maybe has like 20 citations. But like all John Cardi's papers, it's a gem. And uh, so Cardi says, well, yeah, no, this problem is not any different than any other RG problem. You just have to, to do uh, a field uh, transformation on this, uh, uh, on, on, on your fields. And by doing this field transformation, this linear field transformation, I'm going to give you a linear field transformation that will exhibit this marginal interactions. But there is a small price to pay. And the price that you, you're going to pay uh, is that this field transformation is going to break or rather going to obscure to make it non-manifest the SN invariance of this problem. So, uh, uh, so the, the field transformation, well, I, I'm not going to try to motivate it. Uh, I'm going to give you some of these properties. It's, it's this one, so you introduce uh, fields curly phi omega such that the field phi one is phi plus omega over two while all the other fields phi i are given by curly phi minus omega two plus chi i where chi i are the fields which sum of chi i So th that's a transformation that you can try to motivate. I'm not going to try to do this, but uh, this transformation has uh, some properties. Uh, so when you when you do this and you apply it to this uh, replicated Lagrangian, then um, well, you can check this. But what basically happens is that well, for example. Uh, you, 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 can, you can try to think, what, what does this transformation do to a replicated Lagrangian? First of all, this, this thing, sum of phi i that you have here, that's just going to become, uh, that's, that's just going to become uh, phi one, which is curly phi plus omega over, over two, plus, well, it's going to become uh, n minus one because there are n minus one fields phi i uh, times curly phi minus omega over two plus the sum of chi i's, which is zero. And so you get, uh, and so you see what you get. You get n times curly phi, and that goes to zero in the limit and goes to zero. While for omega, you get, uh, you get plus, uh, in the limit, when n goes to zero, you get omega because 
this factor my n minus one becomes minus one. So you get omega over two plus omega over two. So this factor, this sum of phi i's just becomes omega. So, so you get this uh, kind of counterintuitive factors in the limit when n goes to zero. And because of this counterintuitive factors, your Lagrangian becomes, uh, so let me write down what it becomes. It, uh, so you have uh, the kinetic term becomes d phi d omega minus h over two omega squared plus some d chi i squared plus everything else is order n. Then you, well, let me first, so this already has some very interesting consequences. So you see that from, from here, you see that uh, the dimensions of the fields curly phi, curly omega and chi, they, uh, which you read off from this Lagrangian, they are not your uh, familiar scaling dimensions of scalar fields. Because so the, this field chi is going to get dimension as a scalar field in the dimension d over two uh, minus one, uh, while uh, the field uh, omega is going to get dimension uh, d over two, right? Because omega squared, you, you should not view it as a as a mass term because there is no term d omega squared. So if you really, you should really view the term uh, omega squared as a part of the kinetic term of your Lagrangian. And the field phi uh, gets the dimension d over two minus two. So, so you get a multiple of fields, phi, chi, and omega, which all have different dimensions. And so now you can say, okay, wait a second, this is really weird because I started with a theory which had SN invariance. I did some uh, linear transformation of the fields and I got three fields, phi, omega, and chi, and they all have different scaling dimensions. So how can this happen? Well, there is some story uh, to tell here, but again, I'm not going to, um, I can tell you a story later, but this is something that bothered me for a while, but uh, we found a way to, we found the mental picture which explains this. Uh, so I can tell this later if you're interested in. Uh, but first let me finish the transformation of the Lagrangian. So if you take this cardiac transform and you imply it, apply it to the mass term, sum of phi i squared that we had in our Lagrangian, then you get without writing uh, relative coefficients, you get omega phi plus sum of chi i squared. And if you write, if you write, uh, if you take the quartic interaction, uh, here you get uh, omega phi cube, phi cube plus phi squared, sum of chi i squared plus dot, dot, dot. And uh, so th the interesting thing is here, because if you use the, these scaling dimensions, which follow from the kinetic term, then the quartic interaction is marginal in d equals six. So lo and behold, we had this very confusing Lagrangian with two couplings, one irrelevant, one relevant. Uh, it was very confusing. Here, uh, John Cardi told us that, that we can just do this field transformation after transformation. We have a system of fields which are subject to a near marginal interaction in six minus epsilon dimensions. And, uh, and the terms that I dropped here are uh, some irrelevant terms with respect to these dimensions that I derived. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, so 
the Azad's cardimate is like break the ON symmetry, right? The the replica symmetry. There's no SN there's no ON symmetry in this problem. There's SN symmetry. Right, SN symmetry. The, and yeah. why why that and the, why why that uh, um, correct uh, maybe the good uh, ANSATS to take? Apart well, it's from not an ANSATS. Mind you, it's not an ANSATS. Mind you, it's not an ansatz. It's it's a field. It's a linear transformation of fields. So as long as you don't drop any terms after doing a linear transformation of fields without due justification, you are not making any mistake. Well, but uh, no, like it, naturally, it, if I take the limit and goes to zero, then yeah. summing over phi i squared just gives me zero because I have nothing to sum. But uh, by this redefinition, he, you got it equal to omega, right? Now, I just uh, have summing over phi i to the fourth. Yeah. I from one to n, take a limit of n goes to zero. I thought it means zero, but it's equal to omega. No, 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 it will never be zero. Sum phi to the fourth is not going to be a zero operator. Whatever you do, even if you take, uh, even if you take, uh, you, you might not uh, have played uh, with replicated theories, but if you do, if you say take a correlation function of the field phi i to the fourth, sum of phi i to the fourth, computed using weak diagrams. Yes. And take the limit n goes to zero, it's not going to go to zero. But, well, yeah, that if you like insert, you calculate correlator, so you insert something. In uh, like uh, <clears throat> uh, in the in the path integral, but yeah. here you're just directly manipulating the path integral itself. Yeah. Yes. In the limit of n goes to zero, I just have a ratio of uh, to uh, to z's, right? Z over z. So so uh, the, what is the meaning of this manipulation? So the meaning is this: we have so this is very concrete. So you take when we have a replicated Lagrangian. From this replicated Lagrangian, we compute we can compute some correlation functions. So uh, these correlation functions are definitely non-zero for non-zero n. The limits of these correlation functions remain non-zero for non-zero for zero n as well. So when I do uh, a linear transformation of fields, the correlation functions of certain operators they map to correlation functions of transformed operators. Equal correlation functions map to equal correlation functions. So the, the meaning of these transformations is very concrete. It's the transformations which is supposed to simplify expressions for correlation functions. You can think about it this way. You should, if you think that the sum of something from one to n goes to zero in the limit n goes to zero, then you are missing the point of the replica method. It's not, doesn't go to zero. Well, for correlation, it doesn't I... go to zero. But just uh, without any correlator, the whole path integral should be equal to one. The operator right? doesn't have the, the only thing which goes to one is the partition function. Yeah, the partition function. The partition function goes to, yeah. Yeah, so how do I say that this partition function goes to uh, one in the limit of one goes to zero? Maybe let me ask before. So uh, the, Well, that, that's that's a bit uh, that's a bit technical, but let me let me tell you if you ask. So uh, the thing is the following: in this in this theory, there are going to be uh, two. There are going to be one should distinguish two kinds of operators. There are going to be operators which are SN singlets. And they are going to be operate well. For example, sum of phi i to the fourth. is an example of an essence singlet operator. And then there are going to be operators which are not a sense singlets. For example, I can take operator phi one, that's not an essence singlet operator. Now, the, the, what is true is that if I look at the correlation function of non-singlet operators, so for example, phi one, phi two, or things like that, this is non-zero. 
any correlation function of in a sense singlet operator so a singlet singlet if you if i if i just consider correlation functions of singlets of only singlets without inserting any non singlet operator then any such correlation function is going to be zero so uh, so this so this operator is a singlet operator so its correlation functions are going uh, to be zero if I only insert singlet operators. If I insert any non singlet operator, that's not going to be right. This operator in this uh, uh, field basis, it's going to have exactly the same property. So this operator, if I just, uh, if I consider its two point function, say with itself, it's, it's also going to be zero. Is that because of the uh, chi i in the limit of n goes to zero have total number minus one? Uh, uh, well, it's 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 based on a particular. So it's some. Uh, uh, well, actually, I mean, for example, this operator by itself is not going to have a zero cor correlation function. This operator by itself is not going to have a zero correlation function. But if you if you combine them together. You compute the total two point function is going to be vanishing. There's a reason for that. There's a supersymmetry reason for that. But okay, I'll maybe be trying well, out. What I'm uncomfortable about this is you you implicitly use the first take the limit of n goes to zero to argue uh, this critical question, right? You, you need to use that well, because uh, yeah. when you have this h to the phi i uh, square summing over. Uh, the sorry, uh, when you have this h times omega squared, you already use take the limit of n goes to uh, zero. Well, yeah, I have here all of them, yeah, yeah, and uh, but in the, this connected term of summing over uh, partial chi squared isn't well defined in the limit of n goes to zero because you have no, come on, come on. everything. Everything here is well defined. All correlation functions are well defined. There's no singularities proportional to n. If it makes you uncomfortable, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. You just have to do a few calculations. Okay. I, I'm trying to tell you a new way to think about these things. Uh, after I'm done finishing, finished uh, telling okay. you about this, you can right. see if you, if you can use it in some other problem that you're interested in, or maybe it's completely useless for you. But I cannot make you more comfortable at this stage. So let me just proceed. So I think uh, in, even though the first time you see it, it may look like I'm, um, I'm doing uh, something non-conventional. That's precisely the point. It's non-conventional, but it shows that Random field easing model is not an exception. It's just like any other field theory near upper its upper critical dimension. And it's going to make me, allow me to perform some other calculations, which people uh, have not been able to perform using the old formalism. So let me try to, in the last 10 minutes or so, get you to these calculations. But first, I, I wanted to say some words about this thing which is called Parisian or last supersymmetry. Which is something uh, again very easy uh, to see in this Cardi formulation of the theory because so Cardi has this n minus one fields chi i uh, which satisfy the constraint sum chi i equal to zero so effectively you have minus two fields and uh, you can, and they also only enter into the Lagrangian at this renormalizable level that I wrote, they only enter quadratically. So you can, uh, at this quadratic level, you can replace these fields by, so you can replace chi i's by two anti commuting scalars, psi and psi bar, two real anti commuting scalars. And so as a result of this, you get the Lagrangian. So you get d phi d omega minus omega squared plus d psi d psi bar plus m squared omega phi 
plus psi psi bar plus lambda omega phi cube plus uh, phi squared psi psi bar. And so now, uh, okay, this conclusion depends on the relative coefficients that I'm not writing here, but you can introduce a super field. Uh, it's kind of uh, this, the easiest uh, supersymmetric field theory because you have a you have a scalar, you have an orthosymplectic uh, superfield where uh, the Grassmann coordinates don't carry spinner indices. So you just have uh, psi uh, theta psi bar plus uh, theta bar psi plus theta theta bar omega. And so in terms of this uh, superfield, you just write a supersymmetric Lagrangian with in, in, in super space, so d dx, d theta, d theta bar. And this supersymmetric Lagrangian, just once you integrate over theta, theta bar, it, it gives you uh, this Lagrangian I wrote here. And uh, well, uh, this shows that uh, in the infrared, in this problem, we expect uh, to find a supersymmetric fixed point. Well, supersymmetric with respect to this uh, weird non-unitary Parisian surlass supersymmetry, with uh, which violates uh, it's non-unitary because it violates spin statistics. And um, this supersymmetry is an emergent symmetry, so it's not present at the microscopic level in this problem. It's emergent because to get to the supersymmetric Lagrangian, I had to drop uh, some terms, like for example, these dot 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 terms, I had to drop them here. But nevertheless, it's expected to be there. And if uh, you get, if you have the supersymmetric field theory in the infrared, then there is uh, another argument that I'm, I'm not going to review, but it's based on a sort of OSP uh, two slash two localization that this uh, supersymmetric field theory it has uh, a subsector of observables actually a rather large subsector of observables in particular all uh, critical exponents which are captured by a d minus two dimensional non supersymmetric field theory uh, with the same potential so it's uh, d phi squared plus V of phi with the same scalar potential I, I started with. So this is called dimensional reduction. And so, uh, and so what, what, what does this uh, imply? Well, this suggests, for example, that this uh, random field easing model in D dimensions it should have the same critical exponents as the non supersymmetric easing model in D minus two dimensions. But uh, the truth is not quite what I just described to you. Uh, so if you look at uh, if you look at various theoretical arguments, if you look at Monte Carlo simulations, if you look at even some theorems that mathematicians have proven you realize that what I have just described to you is a, is a simplification of, of the real truth uh, of the real phase diagram of this model. And uh, well, what is, what is the, the truth? So I'm going to tell you something which is not, uh, which I believe is the correct situation. So maybe not everyone will agree with me, not all the experts, but I think that's my, way to interpret all the wealth of data which have been accumulated on this model. So here I'm plotting in the theory space what this model uh, looks like as a function of D. First of all, in every D I have a Gaussian uh, Parisi Surla's supersymmetric theory. So free, Free Parisian Surla supersymmetric Lagrangian definitely exists in any D. 
<clears throat> then, as I said, for D smaller than six, this quartic interaction is relevant. So we are going to have a supersymmetric fixed point. So this is going to be a Parisian Schurlas uh, supersymmetric non Gaussian fixed point, which exists below six dimensions, uh, except that it does not exist, it stops existing in three dimensions. Why can't it exist in three dimensions? Because we know that in one dimension, the easing model doesn't have a fixed point. The, the, in one dimension, the easing model doesn't have a phase transition. So the SUSY, SUSY fixed point in 3D cannot exist. It stops existing exactly in 3D. But the situation is complicated by the fact that there, is, there exists another branch. There exists another fixed point, another branch of fixed points, which branches off this Parisian Surlas supersymmetric one somewhere at some critical dimension DC, which is below four and five. And it is, so the, the field, the, the phase transition in the random field easing model is described by the supersymmetric branch above DC and by this non supersymmetric branch below DC. So that's, uh, that's the situation. And this, I believe, is based on the fact that, for example, the critical exponents that people measure in the Monte Carlo simulations, then in 5D, they agree with, with SUSY, while in 4D and in 3D, they don't agree with SUSY. So if you try to think how uh, this can happen. Uh, that's one conjecture that, that you come up with. And so. Uh, Sorry, is there a statement about what the other theory is on this uh, upper blue line that's coming down? Not at this stage, what the not, uh, not at this stage. I did not make any statement and uh, so I, at this point, I, I'm ready to say what is the main, what was the main goal of our papers. The main goal of our papers was to understand how this Parisian Surlas supersymmetric fixed point, non Gaussian one, how it loses stability. Why is it that there is this critical dimension DC uh, that this fixed point loses stability? What is the new interaction that becomes relevant at this dimension DC. So this question, this uh, very natural question uh, has never been answered before our work. And the, the reason why it has not been answered in my opinion is that because people, uh, they, uh, they, they prefer to work on, the, on this as an invariant uh, formulation manifest as an invariant formulation, which was obscuring the, the structure of the marginal interactions, they, they were never able to carry out this calculation in that basis. While in our paper, we, we did this calculation because we, we had this CARDI basis at our disposal. So we could, uh, uh, we could basically systematically consider all possible effects, all possible uh, SN invariant interactions. So we, we could consider all possible SN invariant interactions. We could transform them uh, to, to the CARDI basis. And then we could, uh, we could uh, compute the anomalous dimensions of, of all of these operators. We could classify them uh, we, we, we analyzed the gazillion operators actually, but because it was so systematic, we could, uh, eventually we found, uh, the two operators that are in our opinion, the candidates for this, 
uh, for this instability because they have indeed uh, negative anomalous dimensions and they can render the theory unstable. Now, uh, I'm, uh, I realize that I am, on the one hand, I'm uh, uh, basically at the end of my time. On the other hand, uh, this discussion uh, probably uh, got quite technical already at this stage. So maybe I should, uh, uh, I, I should uh, kind of pause and ask you uh, what you guys uh, feel like if there is anything uh, you'd like me to expand on or is this something that is already more than you can take and things like that. So please. Yes, so maybe we can pause for some official question asking, answering part, and then uh, if it's not too late for you and if people want to stick around, then maybe you could explain us a bit more technical details about that. Sounds good. Okay, so then, yeah, let's, let's thank Slava for the official part of the talk and uh, see if there are any questions. Hi, Slava. I didn't quite understand how the dimensional reduction occurs. Um, you said like there's a localization argument. Um, can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can. So, uh, so this localization. So. Um, Localization argument, in fact, is kind of an analogy. So uh, the, the supersymmetric localization usually uh, operates in a situation where you have some uh, supersymmetry action, which which makes a certain uh, manifold invariant. Maybe it's a manifold in the field space, or maybe it's a manifold in uh, in, in, in space time, or something like that. So in this case, if you look at if you look at the subgroup OSP two slash two uh, of um, which it's a subgroup of the order simplicity group, which is the symmetry of the superspace. So it it leaves invariant the subspace theta equals theta bar equals zero and x perpendicular equal to zero. So yeah, so the the invariant which is uh, the manifold which is left invariant is this d-dimensional uh, subspace of your uh, of r d slash two and and also the fields if you if you look at the fields of the components of the super fields phi x theta theta bar and you you set in the fields uh, x perpendicular theta and theta bar to zero, then those components of the superfields are also left invariant by this action. So that's, uh, th this is the suggestion that uh, the theory should localize to, to this manifold. Mm -hmm. It's not a proof, just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. so, so in our work, uh, we actually mm, took uh, a slightly different approach to the problem because localization is a, is a Lagrangian argument and uh, there are other Lagrangian arguments based, for example, on perturbation theory. You can compare perturbation theory uh, for the supersymmetric theory and for this non-supersymmetric theory in D minus two dimensional space. And then you can check that if you insert operators only in this uh, d minus two dimensional space and compute their correlation functions in the full theory and in the localized theory, you find in perturbation theory exactly the same answers. So this is this has been known for a long time. So I see. In, so in our work, in our work, we took a kind of a different approach. We decided to see if this localization. Uh, make sense from the abstract uh, non-perturbative CFT point of view. For example, we checked whether it makes sense to have a, 
a theory in D dimensions which satisfies CFT axioms or supersymmetric CFT axioms, and then you put everything to D minus two dimensions. Is it going to still satisfy those axioms? For example, is there still going to be a local stress tensor D minus two dimensions and things like that? And we saw that even this non-perturbative checks, they can still uh, be satisfied quite robustly. So we got convinced that this dimensional reduction in the presence of supersymmetry is really true. I see. Thanks. So Slava, I'm I'm well this this Cardi framework I wasn't familiar with. And and thank you very much. It seems to be very powerful. So I'm still going on my knowledge of Parisi Surlas from, I don't know, like before you were born or something like that. They're on the um, time. But but it um it went in a somewhat different way. And I wonder if you could let me say what I think were the main features as I remember them, and maybe you can correct me and explain why this approach is so much more successful. So what Parisi and Surlas did was that they introduced some fermionic variables, um, spin zero fermionic variables to uh, obey constraints in the theory. And they had a theory with the space-time symmetry OSPD slash two. Yeah. They then recognized that the casimirs of OSPD, um, OSP N1, N2 depend only on N1 minus N2. So if you compute in perturbation theory, it's the same result as dimensionally reducing by two. And that was more or less the whole argument. And um, now this is very different. And I wonder if you could compare, I hope I got right what Parisi and Surlas did, compare that to what you're doing. Um, well, uh, you, you see in the Parisi and Surlas work, there are two conjectures. And uh, the, the first conjecture is to, to explain whether supersymmetry appears in the random field Ising model or not. And that for this part of the conjecture, their argument was very, very different from Cardi's argument. And uh, it, it was based on, um, it was basically a perturbative argument. They, they looked at some diagrams, they computed them uh, without doing even replica tricks. They, can, they, they noticed that the most singular diagrams were reproduced by some uh, classical field theory uh, with some determinant uh, constraint added. Then they put, the, the, they uh, reproduced this determinant by introducing this uh, uh, fermionic variables, and that was it. And that argument had some caveats. Uh, for example, if you look carefully at this determinant, then you would see that actually what they needed was not the determinant, but the absolute value of the determinant. And so they had to argue that actually determinant and the absolute value of the determinant is the same, but it was very hard to argue that they, they were the same. So the argument had some caveats and uh, Cardi's argument also has some caveats, uh, but the, the caveats in Cardi's argument, they are of a kind that are easier to test because these are just RG caveats. You know, Cardi drops some terms. If those terms are irrelevant, then it's okay. If they are actually relevant, then it's wrong. But we know how to determine if the term is relevant or relevant. You just compute its anomalous dimension, you see what happens. So that's why we went Cardi's way. Hmm. Now, the second part of Parisi's last argument about how to give on the supersymmetric theory to show that there is a dimensional reduction, uh, that was based on, uh, you know, Casimir's, you mentioned Casimir's. In fact, there was, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not familiar with Casimir's playing a role in their work. It was just some, they wrote, th their main, their, their main uh, advantage was that they noticed that this computation this is very easy in position space. Well, before them, people like Aharoni 
uh, and others, they actually did, they already did this observation, but they did it all in momentum space. It was very hard to, to show this. Mm. Uh, so the perturbative argument to see that it's the same, it's uh, really, um, it's really easy. Just have a propagator, propagate as a radial function, super space. Uh, there was not, uh, at least in the papers that I'm familiar with, there was no Casimirs. But interestingly, okay. in our work, Casimirs did play a role because we did perturbation theory, or sorry, we did, we did group theory. We wanted to see that this uh, field content, I mean, in conformal field theories, they have many different primary operators transforming in different representations. Uh, you know, some Young tableau. And we wanted to see how the Young tableau in D minus two dimensions, they uh, talk to Young tableau in, of this orthosymplectic group with D slash two and whether the Casimirs agree and things like that. Uh, but this I have not seen uh, done by Parisius or Lass. Some other people did such things, but not Parisius or Lass. Yeah, maybe well, I should look at Casimir's, but the group theory factors are all group theory factors big time. Yeah, because because Casimir's do play a role in conformal field theory a lot. For example, we checked that the conformal blocks of the D minus two dimensional theory they satisfy the same equations as the super conformal blocks of of this Parisian last theory, and nobody checked this before. But this plays a role. I mean, to, to check this, you have to study conformal Casimir's. Okay. Hmm. Um, if it's not too boring for other people, I have one more question, which is uh, in the diagram you drew that we're looking at now, there's an instability at DC, which corresponds to some operator of the conformal field theory, which I guess is very hard to understand what that operator is because it's in another conformal field theory. But I wonder if you can tell us what that operator there is with respect to the Gaussian fixed point for which there should also be this kind of supersymmetry breaking instability. Maybe that's easier to understand. Uh, yes, I can. Well, I can, I can write these operators explicitly. It's um, because, you know, the limitation of our approach is that we only work in perturbation theory around 6D because we just do yeah. six minus epsilon expansion. So all our operators are uh, labeled by Gaussian operators and and actually uh, so there are two operators and they have pretty easy exp expressions so one of them is uh, is uh, some chi I squared squared and the other is some chi I cube squared minus three halves some chi I squared, some chi I to the fourth. Hmm. Well, these are just, you know, these are just some expressions, but I want to point out two uh, maybe most interesting features of these two operators. Uh, one of them is that the first operator is what we call a SUSI null operator. Because if you map it to the SUSY variables, it becomes psi psi bar squared. But since psi and psi bar are, are just Grassmann scalar fields, this is zero. So you have to a little bit uh, think of this operator actually can have any physical effect or not and so on, but actually it does, it, it can have a physical effect. And this operator also is interesting. It's, some, it's a class of operator that we call non susy writable because you cannot even, uh, you cannot even uh, transform it to SUSY variables because it has these pieces like chi I cube or chi I to the fourth, but the only things that, uh, that, that you can transform to SUSY variables are things which are bilinear in chi's. So, so could you actually, what, was, what was the rule for transforming to SUSY variables? Well, at the quadratic level, you, you can transform, uh, there is a well-defined set of rules, uh, but um, basically the, the theory of chi's, this theory of phi omega and chi's 
even though the full theory has a sin invariance, this theory phi omega and chi at the renormalizable level, it has an emergent, it has actually an accidental O n minus two symmetry. And the operators that uh, that uh, preserve this O n minus two symmetry is the operators which are basically at most bilinear in chi's, they, they can be transformed to SUSY variables. But the operators which break this O n minus two to S n, they cannot. So these are still good operators, but uh, they cannot be transformed to these variables. So you have to study them in this chi field basis, and this that's also a technical complication. But the way you transform to SUSY variables, you just replace any bilinear in chi's into this something quartic and fermions. Well, the, yeah, so sum of chi squared is transformed to psi psi bar, and then you can give rules also for operators with derivatives. We give it in our, mm -hmm. in our paper, but only for bilinear fields. So, any for bilinears and products of bilinears and so on. So, any operator you can calculate its uh, dimension in the chi basis. And then it, some of them have analogs in the SUSY basis that allow you to understand you're doing it correctly, but in the chi basis, you can see the instabilities. Yeah, so, so chi, chi basis is the most general one. For some operators, you can do the calculation in both bases. And the operators for which you can do the calculation also in the SUSY basis, uh, those are very nice because you actually don't even have to do this calculation because you can take advantage of the of the dimensional reduction and you can just compute the dimension of those operators in in a d minus two dimensional theory, which is a much easier theory. But you can compute in three theories basically and see that it's the same result. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yeah, this is pretty cool. But, but to see the instabilities, you have to go out of the SUSY basis. The, these operators yeah. somehow don't exist in that basis. Yeah, because in fact, uh, there are also SUSY writable operators that you have to look at. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of them are pretty, uh, are pretty benign because you can kind of convince yourself that they cannot do anything. Uh, Bad, they are all irrelevant. There are some potentially uh, some potentially dangerous SUSY writable operators, but we checked them and they don't. Uh, they, they have a mildly negative relation, but they don't become they don't seem to become relevant. Well, these guys really they have big negative anomalous dimensions, so they they really go down and they they cross relevance threshold between four and five. So they it look like it looks like those up their operators. Okay. Well this is incredibly cool. So let me cede the floor to uh, pe other people have questions. Does the difference between the bond disorder and the field disorder that you described, does it reflect some physical difference of those two models? So in the case of bond disorder, you have replica rep symmetry breaking, which is a whole nother direction for this. Is that right? In the case of bond disorder? Yes. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, there's no replica symmetry breaking, nor for bond disorder, nor for, for field disorder. In fact, the replica symmetry breaking is a pretty benign uh, thing in situations when you expect you will have a fixed point, it's like mostly affects things where you you have some sort of <clears throat> gapped phase. No, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, Douglas, so you've seen that in the replicated Lagrangian, it was, the difference was very clear because the replicated Lagrangians in the bond disorder and the field disorder, they really had different symmetry. In the one case, it was uh, S n right uh, versus Z two to the n. Z two to the n, and in the other right. case, it was S n uh, Z two. Uh, now, if you look at the non-replicated theory, then both 
bone disorder and field disorder, they both preserve they both preserve the two invariants. But in the case of bone disorder, the Z2 invariance is, is preserved only if you just transform just by transforming the, the spins by themselves. Well, in the case of the field disorder, to preserve the two invariants, you also have to flip the distribution of of the right. It's whether it's preserved realization by realization or not. Exactly. Yeah. So that's uh, that that must be the the key difference between the two situations. Is there something like like uh, the partition function? Is it self averaging or something in in one case but not the other, or is it not self averaging in both cases? Uh... It's um, it's a good question. So in fact, uh, th there were some simulations which uh, were trying to argue that uh, that in the case of field disorder, the partition function was not self-averaging. The correlation length was not self-averaging. I'm not sure about the partition function. Uh, but those are pretty old simulations like about uh, 10, 20 years ago. And I'm not sure it's still true. Uh, the, the high quality simulations for the random field easing model have appeared like basically in the last five, six years. It's really, um, it's really a recent uh, story. So like people really nailed down the critical exponents and so on. It's, uh, so I'm not sure if people, uh, if the, have really agreed about what's self-averaging, what's not self-averaging in these models. Do you have any idea whether which type of behavior would be generic? Like whether there's a CFT at each n or whether it's only as n goes to zero? In, in this case, I believe there's only, only at n equals zero. But um, suppose we take a different CFT and perturb it by some disorder in the UV, do you have, well, do you have any sense for whether the bond disorder or the field disorder is a better representative? Mm, I'm not sure, no. I, <laughs> uh, no, it's hard to say. Are we discussing the symmetry in particular or also the dimension of the operator that we put by. I was just wondering whether we should expect to have a CFT for each value of n or whether only as n goes to zero, like in the field disorder case. Good question, but I, I don't have a, a ready-made answer. But so could you remind, like in your language, how do you see that there is no CFT for n not equal to zero? Uh, because already in the kinetic Lagrangian, so when, I, when I do this field transformation and I look at the kinetic Lagrangian, so I said that it maps to this, but it maps to this more plus some very, uh, some very strongly relevant uh, corrections, like there's d phi squared, for example, with a coefficient which is order n. And I just uh, I, I just don't see how. So so there is this. In in fact, there was some work which tried to follow this flow even for n non-zero and see what happens. There was some old work and, uh, and they found some fixed point even for n non-zero, but that fixed point had uh, of course uh, a feature that was completely disconnected from this n equals zero fixed point, meaning that uh, because the RG flow becomes as n goes uh, as n becomes uh, smaller and smaller 
there is this relevant perturbation which becomes smaller and smaller. And so, you know, very slowly you will get away from the fixed point and flow away somewhere. And that somewhere is very far away and is disconnected. So it's, so there might be some physics for, there might be some fixed points with n equal to zero, but they are, they are completely disconnected from this interesting n equals zero fixed point. Like if you computed critical exponents there and try to continue them analytically to n equals zero, I think this just doesn't make any sense. Unlike in the bond disorder case. So there is nothing so in, in the UV that you can tune to just set this operator to zero. I mean, having a relevant operator doesn't necessarily remove a CFT, right? It's, it, it says that, well, if it is there, it would be unstable. But, but the claim is that there is really, there is nothing you can tune to, to set this if I square thing to zero. No, this you definitely cannot tune because the relative coefficients of these operators that are fixed by a sense symmetry. And mm -hmm. just the sense symmetry then not equal to zero, it tells you that this operator is there. So, mm -hmm. so I concluded that this, uh, the, the, that, that just, yeah. Unless you break replica symmetry, right? Then you can tune separate. But yeah, I do not know what that would mean. And then what about the supersymmetry? Uh, is this also something very special to Ising model or there is there is some class, there are some also some polymers, right? Or where something similar uh, happens or? Yeah, thanks for asking. So there are two models of, um, there's a pretty interesting story. In fact, we are still uh, finishing. So we, we believe we have a picture uh, but to claim that we have really like a full solution of, uh, and we completely full solve the puzzle, we have to consider this branched polymer case. So for, uh, for people who uh, do know, do not know what it is, I'll just say that it's, it's a, it's a cousin problem where, um, you consider instead of, you consider the same problem, but with a cubic potential. So your, your, your problem uh, to start with is, is something like this, plus phi cube. Uh, and well, we know that uh, this um, problem with cubic potential has a fixed point with imaginary cubic coupling. This is the Li-Yang universality class. And so now you consider kind of random field generalization of this Li-Yang universality class. So there is no, Z2 symmetry anymore is a SN invariance and the critical dimension is D equal eight. And in this case, so indeed uh, it has been shown by Parisian Sterlas that this problem is related to branched polymers and branched polymers are just uh, some subsets of a lattice which are not self-intersecting and they allow, uh, they, they, they can have you know, they can join like this in some points. They can have cubic joining points. So things like this. So if you just consider all possible subsets on the lattice of this form, and if you study their statistics, then uh, this, for example, the partition function or the free energy of these guys on the lattice is described by this model n equals zero limit of the Li-Yang replicated Lagrangian. And as you can imagine, this, this branched polymers on the lattice, they are very easy to simulate. So, because it's just some sets of Elias. And so people have simulated them extensively and, and they see that in this case, the dimensional reduction just perfectly works. There is the critical exponents with branched polymers in D dimensions always agree with Li Yang critical exponents in D minus two dimensions. So why is that? Well, because in this case, the Paris is for last supersymmetric theory does not have this instability. That's what I believe. 
but now we have to show this. So we have what what uh, what we are doing is that we are applying exactly the same formalism in uh, in this problem, and uh, as far as we can see. You know, the classification of operators, everything just goes the same. You, you, you don't have, you no longer have the two invariants, so you have more operators to consider. Also, the calculations are, of course, different than phi cube and uh, phi to the fourth theory. But uh, what we see is that the operators which used to have uh, negative anomalous dimensions in this theory, they have positive anomalous dimensions. So we actually don't find any operator which has a negative anomalous dimension. So, well, you can say, well, it's a coincidence, but it's, uh, of course, where the theory loses stability or not, is to some extent is a coincidence, and this turns out to be a happy case. So, so I believe that uh, once we are totally uh, checked this branched polymer case, I think it's going to be very good evidence that uh, we really nailed it down, the mechanism, how the stability is lost. Krislava, in the plot, when you get this number between four and five, you are doing some numerics to find the dimensions of those operators. Uh, are you doing bootstrap or are you doing epsilon expansion? How are you finding those numbers? Uh, no, we're just doing some uh, very naive epsilon expansion. So we like compute it in epsilon expansion. It looks like, uh, uh, well, it looks like, uh, it, it, Eight minus two epsilon, and then we compute it. Actually, the, the non-trivial anomalous dimension is something like two over twenty-seven epsilon squared. This is and for this case, and for the previous for case, case, something yeah. similar. No, no, this is for this is for the case I. This, this is for chi squared squared dimension. Ah, okay. So of course it's like totally you you can say that it's totally wishful thinking. We take this mm -hmm. expansion. Why should we believe it and so on and so forth? But uh, mm -hmm. and I don't want to oversell it. But uh, but the hope is that you know we have set up all this symmetry structure because we we really uh, understood that there are three classes of this. Operators, Susie writable, non Susie writable, and Susie null. Uh, we can, you know, the, the epsilon expansion can be pushed to further orders. One can do bootstrap, as you said, because there, there were actually some attempts to do bootstrap um, using Gliotz's method, because this is a non unitary theory. Uh, but they were totally botched. So th there's some paper by Hikami and uh, you know, we comment on this. We have uh, some discussion about what can really be done, but what he did is really not uh, not, not reliable. So, no, I just wanted to ask what you guys did and yeah, the epsilon I, expansion. We, we did. I, I think our most uh, important achievement is that we understood the symmetry structure of this problem in the cardio basis now, and uh, which is, should be the basis in which this has to be understood. And I think one could do many other things along the same line. So there are tons of calculations to do. Slava, I have another question about the localization computation that you mentioned. Um, so you, uh, you, essentially said that the local localizing fixed point is given by this d minus two dimensional field theory right yeah. um, but in principle when you compute any observable when you do localization you also have to keep track of the one loop determinant and in principle i can see the one loop determining depending on the fields in this d minus two dimensional theory so why uh, why is the one loop determinant not important here or can you like say why it doesn't depend on you know the field content yeah well as i said we didn't really do the localization calculation uh, so um i guess it would be interesting 
I think it would be interesting to do really a localization calculation and see whether this conclusion can be couched in, in those terms. Mm -hmm. So what we actually really did, maybe if in the sense of comparison, maybe I I could compare it better to to the story of um, of Chris Beam and Leonardo Rastelli and uh, Bald van Ries and uh, Madalena Lemos and Pedro Liendo, who who found that in a four dimensional n equal to supersymmetric uh, field theory, if you put certain operators in uh, in a two dimensional plane, then it it gets the structure of a two dimensional CFT and there is a stress tensor and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and for them, it was just a consequence of n equal to supersymmetry. And like all, for example, all operators which they found in this plane, they uh, they found uh, them within the multiplets of this n equal to supersymmetry. So what we did was a much easier version of the same thing because it was really like a baby version because the supersymmetry was much easier. The class of observables that one could put in this d minus two dimensional subspace was much, uh, much uh, wider. So it's um, so it's um, it was much easier. So given if since there's so much interest in this localization, I I cannot uh, resist to mention uh, an open problem in this respect and and to connect to another problem in physics where supersymmetry plays a role which is the problem of to go in the opposite direction. So I told you that given the paris rolas theory, paris rolas supersymmetric CFT, you can get always a CFT in D minus two dimensions. But going the other way around, given a CFT in D dimensions, can you always find a paris rolas supersymmetric CFT in D plus two dimensions? Of course, if mm -hmm. the CFT is Lagrangian, you can try to do this by setting up an RG flow. If your CFT is given in terms of some CFT data, this is not obvious because in fact, there are some representations in D dimensions they, they which map to zero when you go to D minus two dimensions. So there are some representations which decouple. So if you want to construct this high dimensional Paris last supersymmetric CFT, you will have to somehow uh, come up with what those um, representations do. So maybe uh, for this Paris for last story, this is not so physically interesting. It's just a formal problem, but there is one problem in physics where where this is extremely interesting, <clears throat> and this uh, problem is. Um, something called dynamical critical phenomena. So if you have a CFT, if you have a CFT in D dimensions, which for example, describes some critical point, uh, we can uh, study approach to equilibrium of this critical point by considering critical dynamics. And there are various models, depending on how you relax to the like model A, model B, some models which preserves it to invariance, others not. So those, so you add some time. This is not a relativistic time. This is this relaxation time. And you get a theory in D plus one dimension, which is no longer a CFT, it's D plus one dimensional theory. And this theory always has a supersymmetry. This D plus one dimensional critical theory which is hard to solve, it always has a supersymmetry as a consequence of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And uh, the problem of dynamical critical phenomena is a, is a problem, is a very hard problem. For example, if you, uh, if you solve the d-dimensional CFT exactly, for example, two-dimensional easing model, we know how to solve it exactly. But the critical dynamics in the two-dimensional easy model, nobody knows how to solve it exactly. 
and nobody knows how to use the exact solution of two-dimensional easing model to say anything about the critical easing model or about dynamical criticality in the easing model. So if you want to solve dynamical criticality in the model, you just have to start from scratch, like epsilon expansion, just do everything in D plus one dimensions, the same ugly stuff. You'll get some critical exponents, dynamical critical exponents, but this is just work from how can we use this knowledge about uh, exact solution of 2D CFT to learn something about D plus one dimensional criticality. Is an open problem, and perhaps this supersymmetry can play a role in it. Sorry, it's slow. A is, this, is this the same supersymmetry that uh, appeared in this recent studies of hydrodynamics, like Rangamai? I think it's very much related. Yeah, but very but there related. there is well, some, I'm not an expert, but somehow there is some point of view that there the supersymmetry is some sort of red herring that uh, everything just follows from KMS uh symmetry and somehow you don't, uh, you don't really at least you don't need to introduce any any of those uh, ghost fields well maybe there it's i don't know maybe since their theory is not it depends whether the theory is strongly coupled or weakly coupled the theory is weakly coupled you always have more tools at your disposal, but this theory is strongly coupled. So I think it's supersymmetry that you have it. It's not a red herring. It's something if you want to approach the problem maximally and gain some insight from the strong coupling point of view, I, I think it should play a role. What is the standard reference for this supersymmetry in this dynamical critical phenomenon? If there is any? Well, in, in our first paper, we have two papers with our team and Emilio. In our first paper, we have an appendix where we review it. Okay. And there we give reference. Thanks. But no. So there is some similarity, right? It's at the level of some weakly coupled Lagrangian between this, uh, between disorder and this dynamical critical phenomenon, right? Because one description of this dynamical critical phenomenon is also you have some random fields which give some dissipation for you and provides relaxation, right? So do you think that this Parisius Surulus type supersymmetry is always related to to presence of either dissipation or some quench disorder? Is there some understanding why why one follows from the other or that's some coincidences? There is, uh, there is some understanding. So in fact, um, <clears throat> the, the difference between, there's a similarity and there's a difference. So you can phrase this dynamical critical phenomena in terms of some stochastic differential equations with some noise. Mm -hmm. These stochastic differential equations are first order differential equations in case of dynamical critical phenomena. So uh, if you do the same for the Paris sur last, you get uh, you get a, you, you you get some sort of second order uh, stochastic differential equations and they are even like even elliptic so they're not even they're not even evolution equations they're sort of kind of elliptic stochastic equations of the form laplace f equals plus f cube equals some noise so, so they they're not they do not obviously have solutions and or maybe they do not have sometimes unique solutions so, uh, so one of the ways to derive this Parisian Surla supersymmetry in perturbation theory is to 
work in perturbation theory and just focus on one solution of these equations that you get close to f equals zero. And so this way of justifying it has some caveats. And that's why the parties, that, that's why it, it's basically very hard to make progress in the stochastic differential approach to Paris or supersymmetry. If it's wrong, then you don't know what to do. If it works, then, then you're fine. In the case of dynamical critical phenomena, these caveats do not really apply because the equations are always first order. They always have solutions. They're always evolution equations. So that supersymmetry really doesn't need any RG justification. It's, it's manifestly present. It's, it's really manifestly realized. So in your story, it was important that the supersymmetry was not exact. And in this case, you're saying that it's exact? Yeah, in this case, it's uh, manifest. Exactly, yeah, I would say it's exact. Well, in, in the hydrodynamics rules, story, this supersymmetry is supposed to be somehow related to implementing unitarity, which I guess should also be exact. No idea if that's related to the reason for the supersymmetry. In this case, you said fluctuation dissipation. I, I don't know. Fluctuation dissipation is pretty uh, is pretty fundamental. So I uh, I think in quantum mechanical context, it's probably also related to unitarity. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm fascinated by this relation. This is uh, I'm really like shocked that the exact solution of 2D easing cannot be recycled to learn something about dynamical critical phenomena in 2D easing. And this looks like a gap, a big gap in our understanding of critical phenomena. And this this theory that describes the dynamics of 2D easing is some 3D non-relativistic theory, right? It, it's Yeah, it's a 3D non-relativistic theory which has this supersymmetry and which reduces to 2D easing if you put all fields at the same time, at the fixed time. Mm -hmm. but, but dynamics of 2D easing should also be very special due to integrability, right? It shouldn't like thermalize is a is a, is there a big difference on how integrable and non-integrable systems thermalize? Uh, well, it's not a spin chain that I'm studying here. I'm studying the uh, the statistical physics oh. easing. So uh, and. and um, so you say maybe dynamically it's not an integrable system, even though like. So the fix because it's like two plus one dimensional system in 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 real time. So so the integrability of a two D fixed point may not uh, constrain much. May not constrain, approach. May not, yeah, I, yeah. Well, actually, it's a good question. I don't know. I just know that people compute this critical exponents. This this, this is a dynamical critical exponent of. Uh, of the 2D easing and it's known with a bunch of digits, just some number, but they computed by epsilon expansion. It's the only way. By simulations. By the way, I've been recording this whole discussion, but I don't think there is anything, 
anything bad about it. <laughs> Just a bunch of theorists. <laughs> I doubt anybody will watch up to this point. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you want me to cut some part of it, let me know. I'm not working on. By the way, I'm not, I'm not working on on uh, on uh, anything that I was advertising to you guys. I'm very happy to share this uh, frustration that some things that should be solved have not been solved. Do you have any ideas? Do you mind also sending us this the notes? Yeah. From the talk. Yeah, yeah. I hope it worked fine. I was uh, really didn't know how it would work without any anything written beforehand, but it seems to have worked. Yeah. I thought it was great. Yeah. Thanks very much for the talk. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Lava. Thank you. Anybody have questions? Okay, yeah, then I guess we should let Slava go. Here's everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Yeah, thanks. take care. Bye. Bye, Slava. Good night.